Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Gym Master Show, live entertainment lifestyle celebrity talk show series. Hope you guys are doing well. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Jim Masters. This is the place where we are bringing back the lost art of conversation. That's right. And boy, do we have an extraordinary guest who's coming to us from Ohio, USA. Johnny Ray Miller is joining us, extraordinary author. Also, aficionado and real expert and lover of everything partridge the partridge family we're going to talk about that he penned this spectacular book when we're singing the story of the partridge family and their music which answers those questions that you've always had and lots more like before there was music there was family then the family made music or seemingly so before we heard the music we met the family or was it the other way around that's where the story begins. We're going to talk about that with the author of When We're Singing, the story of the Partridge family and their music. The landmark television series, of course, launched the careers of David Cassidy, Susan Day, Danny Bonaducci, Brian Forster, and Susan Crow, while capitalizing on the star power of Academy Award-winning actress Shirley Jones and comedic talents of Dave Madden. And the music from the TV show, loosely based on the cow cells, also stood on its own, thanks to the talents of the greatest singers, musicians, and musical arrangers that ever walked the streets of Hollywood. John Baylor, Tom Baylor, of course, formerly the Love Generation, with Jackie Ward and Ron Hicklin, of course, who created the Ron Hicklin Singers, with the real background voices, musical legends known as the Wrecking Crew, including drummer Hal Blaine, guitarist Dennis Odomir, and Louis Sheldon, and Tommy Tedesco, and Joe Osborne, and Max Bennett all played on these in intricately and brilliantly arranged albums led under the direction of music producer Wes Farrell. And of course, some of the greatest songwriters of the day wrote the original music for the Partridge Family albums, including Bobby Hart, who produced The Monkees, Mike Apple and so many others, producers that worked with Bruce Springsteen were a part of it as well, producers that worked with Jim Croce, we're going to talk about all this, and Rupert Holmes, of course, Barry Mann, Paul Anka, unbelievable. And uh, of course, the legendary Tony Romeo, who penned the Partridge Family's number one smash hit from 1970, I Think I Love You. This hit ABC TV show spanned uh, 10 record singles. That's right, spawned them. And uh, 10 full-length albums. How many of you had those albums and the 45s from the Partridge family? It also launched the solo career of David Cassidy, who became America's number one teen idol of all time, breaking records in concert sales and fan club memberships that have yet to be topped. And that was just in America alone. From Ohio, yes, where he's originally from, our very special guest, Johnny Ray Miller, joining us. He's all casual. It's comfortable. He probably had his dinner and his cup of coffee, and he's ready to talk everything. Television, partridges, you know it, right here on the show, and here he is. My <laughs> friend, welcome to the show. Good to have you with us, Johnny Ray. Hey, that was quite an intro. Thank you so much. The lost art of conversation. <laughs> Isn't that true? Isn't you know, it true? It was, it was a guest that actually said that to me when we were ha when they were on the show. I will forget which guest it is. I have to look back in the hundreds of episodes. But they said, you know, Jim, what you're doing, you're bringing back the lost art of conversation. And I'm like, you know, that's that is what we're doing. That's why I created this, and that's what we're doing. It's kind of cool, huh? And I'm so glad to have yeah. you with us. Oh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. A real honor. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about, and pleasure is all mine, let's talk about this affinity that you have for television and for everything television, but specifically the Partridge family. Because during the time the Partridge family, you know, was on, um, there was so many other shows that were on too. I mentioned some of them, the Brady Bunch, and of course, what, Gilligan's Island, I Dream of Jeannie, Bewitched. Uh, Nanny and the Professor, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, and all these series and shows. What was it about the Partridge family specifically for you growing up, Johnny Ray, that uh, sort of hit a chord with you? You know, it's funny you say that. And, and I thought of a show that you, in all those shows you mentioned, there's one more I loved you didn't mention. It was on the same night, uh, That Girl. 
That girl, yes. Yeah, that was Sam, another one. Sam Denoff. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, another great show. The Partridge Family, what is it that grabbed me? Oh, God, how do you explain, um, you know, whatever it is that makes you a fan of something? Um, for me, I think, uh, number one, it, it was the music when I look back. Um, the music was, um, I don't know, I just, I... I felt like I had an ear at a young age and I recognized it as something that was more than bubble gum. It was more than what they were saying it was. And um, I can't say that I, you know, understood at that age uh, what it was all about. But then, you know, you grow up and the music stayed with me. And um, when I started digging into it and who was behind it, it all started making sense. And David Cassidy has an incredible voice, uh, a, a very, very underrated voice. And so I think that was, it was the music that really grabbed me. Um, but who who doesn't love that uh, warm-hearted family feeling that you get um, when you're watching The Partridge Family? You know, it's um, it was a show that I felt like, um, you know, we know that it was, light we know that it was you know make believe and all of that but the actors were very good and the writing was very good and and i think that the characters were relatable in that era in that time um i can think of some shows from the era that that aren't relatable that weren't as believable as the actors that that were on the partridge family they had a really good slate of actors on there so you know you package all that together and it just uh it just got me it was the show that you know hooked me <laughs> let's talk about your incredible background you have too within the industry you know i i mentioned the extraordinary background that you have uh johnny ray working in television and theater as a concert and theater producer and you've done this for a long time and you've worked as well on some of these other iconic and epic television shows and, and films how did you first get started in this? What inspired you to want to go into television and film uh, growing up in the Midwest? Well, you know, I got to say the Partridge family was uh, a show that, you know, made me think about that. Um, I, I grew up wanting to perform, you know, whatever it is that makes you want to do that. Uh, but I had that in me. And uh, in my uh, upper teens, I got involved in community theater and um, I went to college for it. My degree is in theater and it just kind of, I don't know, it just kept on evolving. Um, I uh, ran a theater uh, at a pretty young age uh, for a long time and I left that job and um, uh, I, I loved the theater more than anything. I, I felt very in my element when I was working in the theater. And eventually I ended up uh, at a little bit bigger theater than the one I started in. And it was there that I thought that the dream, the dream came true that I thought would be the beginning and the end, which is that I hosted David Cassidy for a concert. So when that happened, um, I, I had no idea what was coming after that, <laughs> but, but it went so well. And <laughs> that's kind of how it all morphed into, you know, me writing this book. I had David Cassidy behind me. And the next thing I knew I had Shirley Jones behind me and I'm just kind of going, you know, but wow, how did this ever happen? I'm the guy, you know, from the middle of nowhere, Ohio, how did this happen? And uh, it just, uh, it took on a life of its own. And so you know, I just always say, be open to life and wherever it leads you. And that's kind of what I did. And that's how it all happened. I had such a crush on Shirley Jones and Elizabeth Montgomery and Barbara <laughs> Eden. <laughs> yeah. All at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. surprised how many people tell me that they had a crush on Shirley Jones and, and instead of Susan Day. I hear Shirley Jones more than I hear Susan. Sorry, Susan. <laughs> uh, yeah it's just that warmth and that caring and the kindness uh, that exuded which she is anyway but especially on that show uh she was always solving the problems and and sort of neutralizing the craziness that was going on all around her yeah 
You know, what's amazing about her is she really is like the character. Um, she, and, I mean, she really is that character. She told me that when I interviewed her and uh, her own son and the people who are close to her have told me, you know, she really is like that. She is. She, she has the same tone. She has the same disposition. Uh, it was a character that she was that she related to when she got the part. It was interesting to her. She was actually offered the Brady Bunch first and she turned it down. Was she really? Yeah, yeah. And wow. she turned it down because um, she felt that it was a character she had kind of already done. And so yeah. this one had music in it. And because it had music in it, uh, it was, she, you know, she said it was her life. It was very relatable. She, she just felt, you know, very connected to Shirley Partridge. You know, we also had on the show, she's been with us a couple of times, Joyce Boulafon, of course, another wonderful actress. Um, she mentions that she too was in the running to be Carol Brady on the Brady Bunch. Oh, and she wow. was, she, it had been sort of like, you know, scripted with her in mind, but then in, and she was ready to go and all set. And I think they were just about ready to do rehearsals or whatever. And then she got the phone call that they were going to go with Florence Henderson, uh, no who turned kidding. out to be fantastic, of course, as well. And 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 I had an opportunity to meet Florence and chat with her, and she was a phenomenal person, and dearly missed as well. Uh, and I thought she was perfect as Carol Brady, but Joyce Bullifant too, uh, up to the very end, was thought it was hers. <laughs> wow, isn't it funny the near misses in some of our favorite TV shows? Welcome to Hollywood. <laughs> oh, right, right. Like Lyle Wagner was almost Batman and, and it wouldn't that have been different. That's right. That's yeah. right. Exactly. Yes. And would he have ever gone on to the Carol Burnett show? Right. I know another show I love. That's another one in my top five. <laughs> we just did a fantastic um, celebration celebrating Carol's life. Uh, and Harvey Corman's son, Chris was a guest on the show and Roger Calber and several others who were actors and dancers on the Carol Burnett show. And it was really terrific. Uh, I don't know if you ever had an opportunity to meet Carol. I have, and she's just another, these people we're talking about are the real deal. Warm, funny, no egos, very talented, caring, enjoy being around people, no errors about them. Shirley Jones, Florence Henderson, Barbara Eden, Carol Burnett, Dick Van Dyke. I mean, you know, it's like. <laughs> I have never met Carol Burnett, but I would die to meet her. She She's like in my top three people I would just, you know, fall over dead to meet. <laughs> I I love that show. That was, a, that oh, show yeah. inspired me as well. Yes. Um, you know, because it was musical theater, basically, for an hour and uh, comedy, musical comedy. So a lot of the work I did in the theater, uh, there were things that I really like I based on the style of the Carol Burnett show. If we were doing musical comedy, I was always looking back to the Carol Burnett show for, you know, ideas and how they did things. Incredible with Tim Conway and Harvey Corman. Like I mentioned, we had uh, Harvey's son on the show. We also had uh, Tim Conway's daughter, Kelly, on talking about what it was like growing up with Tim Conway as your father, <laughs> which oh, was wow. um, which was really amazing. Um, all great people. And, and the, the just that time period is so beloved, isn't it? And, and now yeah. more than ever. And I think that the, the yeah. pandemic sort of brought out this desire for people to really crave nostalgia even more. I mean, I've always enjoyed all of these shows we're talking about and the music of the time as well. And there is this real craving for Nostalgia. Look at decades and antenna TV and Tubi TV and Me TV and Cozy TV. All of these networks that have access to all of these classic television shows. It's yeah. so cool. Shows that some people thought they would never see again. Yeah. Matter of fact, there's a show that they have put on. Decades did a um, binge weekend, and then I think one of the channels, maybe Me TV, sort of dusted it off and brought it out which is not a comedy like The Partridge Family, but a drama uh, a little bit after The Partridge Family, Family with Sada oh, yeah, Thompson. And, yeah. Uh, 
James Broderick and Christy McNichol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. The seventies and eighties, Christy McNichol. I tell you, you, you could touch her. Absolutely, Emmy-winning actress. Yeah. Um, really amazing. So early on, what were some of the things that sort of came your way that spurred? these opportunities for you to start, start to really work in the industry. Cause you can have a love for these industries that we're in, but then you have to sort of get in and break in and, and stay in. Tell us about some of those early days doing that, Johnny. Ray. Well, you know, living in Ohio, um, it is kind of a unique story. Uh, I worked in the theater and I just started to dabble in, um, in the nineties, independent film was kind of the thing, you know, everybody wanted to, uh, move into the industry and write screenplays and be able to do it all. So I hooked up with um, an agency that was based out of both Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And I started to get like little local commercials and things like that. Um, and then, and then I met some people through that experience and I started doing little student films and, um, and it just kind of kept going from there. And, you know, I was so I was able to do some little things right here from, you know, Ohio. So um, eventually, sparing you the long story, um, I I didn't want to have any regrets. And, you know, I liked my life in the theater a lot, but I and I don't do change well. <laughs> so I wasn't overly motivated to move, but I didn't want to have any regrets. I went out to L.A. for a little bit um, and I. You know, I kind of dabbled in it for a year and it was fun. I had a really good time and I learned a lot. But then I came back and I got another job in the theater in Pennsylvania uh, this time. And it was there then that uh, that I worked with David Cassidy and Davy Jones. So that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the pathway of all of it. And, uh, you know, I never really dreamed I would write a book. I never had a plan to write a book. Um, I never set out to be the one writing a book about the Partridge family, but I was sitting around one day in a coffee shop uh, at a time when my parents' health was going south and life seemed terrible. And, mm. and I, so what do you do when you're depressed? Well, for me, I would surf Partridge family websites, right? Because it was like my mental escape. So <clears throat> I was doing that. And I was kind of silently complaining to myself, you know, why doesn't anybody ever write a book about the Partridge family? It's always the Brady Bunch. It's never the Partridge family, right? And that's when I got the idea. I just kind of thought, you know, I wonder if I could, oh, I could never do that. You know, how could that ever work? And then I thought, hmm, you know, I might have David Cassidy behind me on this. And sure enough, I did. And then, uh, you know, and then with David Cassidy's support, I... I approached Shirley Jones and then I had Shirley Jones. And when you had the two of them behind you, it was, you know, it was just a snowball going downhill, getting bigger and bigger. And so I didn't tell Were anyone. Were you pinching yourself during all these moments? I still do. I still, still have, you still have the marks. Oh yeah. <laughs> I keep adding more. <laughs> it, it's just kind of unbelievable. That's why he's uh, in dark lighting folks. So you don't see them. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed I'm getting a little darker here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just can't, you know, I kind of can't believe it still to this day. It just keeps going and going and going. And I, you know, I got a, I got another book out and I've got several others I'm working on. And yes, you over do. And we're going to have you back to talk about the others too. Very oh, exciting, uh, very exciting stuff coming down the pike that uh, I, I don't want to give it away yet, but because we'll have you back to talk about it with some really, really cool stuff. Um, great stuff. So uh, did you like being out in LA and Hollywood, was that uh, something uh, that grabbed you or did you always still have the hankering to be back home in the Midwest? Well, you know, you know, to put it bluntly, I just came in today to get ready for this and clean myself up from planting a tree in my yard. So <laughs> I, I, I do like home and I do like, uh, I have a lot of roots here and, um, Ah, pun yeah, I like LA. roots tree. I see ah, where you're going. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I like LA. I like to go there and be part of it, but, um, I don't necessarily want to live there. Um, it's just, uh, not really my cup of tea, but yeah. I love to go 
And, you know, I've got a lot of friends there now. And of course, all of these amazing things have happened. So it's it's great with modern technology. You know, that's the great thing about the modern technology is that here we are. We're sitting here doing this interview. And, you know, here I am in the Midwest. Um, that that has been a blessing uh, for me and all of this. Otherwise, it would never happen. I would have to live in L.A. or New York. But um, yeah, yeah. Technology has made all this possible. So I mentioned too, and we'll talk more about the book, but I'm fascinated by the fact that you've had an opportunity to work on some of the most incredible television series, Desperate Housewives, Rules of Engagement, King of Queens, CSI New York, ER, Cold Case, Without a Trace, The OC, and many others. Tell us about that whole other side of your extraordinary career that people might not realize who know you from being an author and all the other stuff that you've done. Well, you know, all of that stuff, it, it was, um, <laughs> I hesitated to put that in my bio, but it, <laughs> I, I was mostly doing background work on those shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had gone out there just to kind of see what could happen. And I had, uh, I had quote unquote, the day job and sparing you that story, which is kind of dramatic and, horrible. And I, I set myself up out there and I wasn't there very long. And I, I just thought I, I need to go home. You know, this, this day job thing that I had was kind of crashing in on me. It was very stressful. And it was a, it was a thing that I was involved in that uh, was really trauma. There was a lot of trauma. I worked for an airline. And then during that era of, you know, nine 11, I was mm. kind of very close to all of what happened there. Yeah, so yeah. I'd set myself up out there and, um, and I just couldn't do it. The stress, uh, kind of PTSD. I had a little bit from some things that happened and oh, I thought, yeah. forget it. I'm just going to go home. So I was going to pack up and come home. And I had a writer friend out there, uh, who'd lived in Cleveland and I knew, and he's, he says, you know, why don't you just, you have nothing to lose, you know, just, just go act. He says, and I just kind of was like, you know, that, that phrase, the right words at the right time. Yes. Well, it was kind of that. Like I had nothing to lose. And so I just went down and I signed up at Central Casting. And it was just one thing after another was going right. It was going well. And I was just doing little background things, but I was meeting a lot of people. And um, yeah, I, I worked for, I, I mean, it was close to a year, I want to say nine months before I came home. But I knew it was going to be temporary because my family and my you know, sick mother and everything was back here. Well, you know, what was I going to do? Uh, right. You know, I, I had people holding down the fort uh, for me back here and I, you know, I had to get home. So it was a great experience that who knows, you know, where that would have went. Right. But I can tell you this about myself. I didn't, I don't like um, the instability of the business, never knowing where your next job is coming from, you know, I like uh, regularity. So it was a lifestyle that, you know, I, I was just real hesitant about. So I came back and and then got in a, a job in another theater. And, um, you know, it was obviously the right thing to do. Uh, things just have rolled forward and worked out for me in a whole different way that I thought it would. So, uh, you know, I think it's important in life to roll with life, you know, not to try to make things happen the way you necessarily want them to go, um, unless they're going and flowing like it's supposed to happen. Um, suddenly, if you open yourself up to possibilities, I, I, I really just discovered with myself that you just really have no idea what's around the corner if you're open to it. So someone once said to me, say yes to life, right? And so, you know, mm -hmm. just say yes and uh, don't shut yourself off. And that's what happened here. Um, I, I really like the path that I'm on and uh, we'll see what happens next. I, I can't believe I'm still I'm sitting here talking to you. So <laughs> see what happens. This is yeah. so you've waited all these years to get on the Jim Masters show live entertainment oh, lifestyle right. celebrity talk show series. And you're here. That's right. <laughs> The, the technology is a little funky today, but we're, we're good right now, it seems, right? Yeah, <laughs> All yeah. All the moons have come together. Uh, so this is terrific. Going back to this book, what was it about wanting to 
write the book and sort of document all of this, Johnny Ray. And again, congratulations on this. I love the cover. Um, Yeah, it's a terrific read. I encourage everybody to get it and we'll tell you how. But um, tell us about the book and the, the inspiration and what it was like, the process like of putting it all together. Because this is, you know, when you're talking about something that is so beloved as a, as a television series and all the great music I mentioned in the introduction, all these incredible people that were involved with the series, but also the music that really made or enhanced the series as well. Um, pretty extraordinary stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did it all get going? Well, the David Cassidy, Shirley Jones thing is what, you know, kind of got the ball rolling. Um, and I didn't tell anyone I was doing it for a very, very long time. So I was approaching people for interviews and the interviews just kept happening. So I interviewed what turned out to be over a hundred people for this book. Um, most people were, uh, thrilled that someone was actually writing a book on the Partridge family and taking the music seriously. So I interviewed every surviving songwriter that I could get a hold of the cast, of course, producers, uh, writers of the show. Um, even the people who designed the record album jackets and people from bell records who were still around. I talked to them too. And it was so yeah, it was so immersive and so um, uh, it was so fun to escape into all of it and learn all these things that I didn't know and, and fans didn't know. And, and I knew what the fans wanted because I wanted the same thing. So in essence, I wrote the book that I wanted to read, you know, um, and so. Man, it took, gosh, it was almost five years, the whole process. And, Did it really? Wow. Yeah. And what ended up happening was, um, are you familiar with Kickstarter? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. All right. So this is a Kickstarter project, this book. Um, What happened was uh, when the time, I met a lot of people along the way. And one of them was a writer, uh, an author, and a musician uh, who has CDs out, was a big Partridge Family fan. And he said, hey, John, don't worry. When the time comes, we'll get you a publisher. So, right, the time came and he says to me, hey, have you ever heard of Kickstarter? And I hadn't, but because of my theater background, I had a really strong background in fundraising. Yeah. So he starts telling me about it. And I thought, oh, man, you know, I I don't want to do that again. I don't want to fundraise. You know, I just, you know, the the sort of dream of I'm going to get a publisher and this book is going to be everything I want it to be. And he says, well, we can get you a publisher, but, you know let me tell you, you'll probably get a paperback. And I kind of went, oh. And he said, oh, you know, you'll probably not have color photos. They'll probably be black and white. And I kind of went, oh. And and so, you know, I had it in my head, what I wanted, right down to the dust jacket. Like everything that that book is, is exactly what I wanted. And so he says to me, you know, if you run a Kickstarter campaign and you raise the money that you need to produce the book you want, you will control it all. And so I was like, at that point, hmm. (laughs) So I thought, all right, you know what? Let's go for it. And so we did it. And uh, it was a 30-day campaign. And we won um, with three days to spare. And uh, the book, it, it it is exactly what I wanted. So, you know, I took the money and hired the the best publisher the best printing company or the best not publisher the best um uh printing company the best editor i could find um the graphic artist uh the layout artist um pretty much you know everything that it takes to do it while at the same time launching like a little publishing company to do it underneath so that's how the book came to be that's why it's as thick as it is um, it has over 500 photos in the middle to all color because I knew that the fans wanted color. So yeah. when we ran the campaign, we went for the color. So it's got 64 pages of full color in there of over 500 photos. Wow. So that's kind of how it all happened. Um, and, and, you know, the ball keeps, I, I keep joking. The bus keeps rolling on. The bus keeps rolling on. I'm going to stay on this bus as long as I can. <laughs> <laughs> which is incredible. Um, 
So what was it like for you growing up watching the series? Um, obviously it spoke to you and it spoke to many, many people. Um, were you just as much in love with the songs and the music as you were with the episodes? Does one lean in some direction or is it equal for you? I would say it was a little leaning towards, because I, I love the show and I think it's well written and well done and yeah. I love everything about it. Um, you know, we all wanted to be part of the Partridge family, right? Uh, but I would say it's 60, 40, 60 more leaning towards the music. I would get out my little tape recorder with the little speaker thing on the end. And oh, when you too, time, huh? Oh, you too. Was it a, yeah. was, right? was it a Panasonic? <laughs> <laughs> it was. Did, did, did you have was. did you have the external uh you know plug-in mic or did you have the condenser mic? <laughs> I had the built in. You know, look, it looked like a little mic. Oh, that's what know? I had. Yes, a little yeah. black with the thin cord. Yeah, and, yeah. It had the handle, the Panasonic had the handle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It tucked right in there. And then I'd shush everybody in the room when the music came on, you know, and I'd hold the thing up to the, to make my little cassette tape of the music. And if somebody talked, I would give them the look, you know, <laughs> you know, it's really amazing. We've talked about this on the show with lots of folks who've come through, who have been on these television shows, actors, actresses, producers. We had uh, Lloyd Schwartz on, of course, son of oh, Sherwood wow. Schwartz. We talked about the Brady Bunch, Gilligan's Island. We have all these great people. Marion Ross from Happy Days was here and a lot oh, of uh, wow. cool people. Well, we've also had a lot of the musicians too, the session musicians, the people who were playing the drums and the violins and the flutes and who wrote a lot of the music uh, that we always enjoyed and some of the theme songs as well. And one of the things about these kinds of shows like The Partridge Family and Dick Van Dyke and, and all the others is the theme song and jingles jingles were big. You had radio station jingles. You had TV promos. You had uh, everybody singing about butter, cars, dog food. It was just <laughs> a certain feeling, you know, everything was singing. And uh, I'd like to teach the world to sing, buy a Coke. And then the theme songs as well. And a lot of these singers were interchangeable. And the Ron Hicklin singers, of course, were iconic and yeah of course ron and and john and tom and all the others the background singers that we hear on the partridge family and the monkeys and love american style and you probably know this but there was a time period and I did some digging because I've always loved the sound of the Ron Hicklin singers. It yeah. was just so representative of the time. It had a, a youthful, fun, warm, there's just hard to pinpoint, but just a fantastic sound. And whenever I do hear it, I, you just feel real good. And you can pick it out right away and say, that's, that's them. That's those singers with that sound, the love generation. I mean, the whole thing, but, um, they were also, there was a period when Ray Conniff shifted some of the singers and wanted in the 70s, early 70s through the 70s, a little bit more of a youthful sound. And he brought in the Ron Hicklin singers and they were the singers, the background or the singers on many of the albums that Ray Conniff and the singers did. They were the singers, the Ray Conniff singers in the 70s uh and it was the same singers you heard on partridge family monkeys love american style after the cow sells and all this all these shows and commercials and everything else i wasn't sure if well, you knew that about the ray conniff connection uh yeah actually so i interviewed the four uh real background singers for the book and um john and How tom cool Baylor were two of them and uh, John Baylor is a very good friend of mine uh, now. Oh. And um, they sang on, you're right, everything. Everything. Records, commercials, movies, everything. Uh, and, and I think, you know, kind of underrated for what they did. We talk about the Wrecking Crew a lot now. So we know a lot about the Wrecking Crew, meaning the musicians who played on all of those albums. Well, they were the voices of the Wrecking Crew. They were the Wrecking Crew 
voices, I guess is the way to say it. That's um, right. You know, they knew how to morph their voice to sound however they needed to sound. And they were the best singers in the industry. Everybody wanted them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There was something about the blend, too, that yeah. was so suited for theme songs and background and uh, things that just made them feel good, feel people feel good. Uh, they were used in a lot of the television promotion campaigns for the networks, too, you know, yeah. the branding and image campaigns and yeah. just really fantastic stuff. So you got a chance to really dig in deep with the singers, huh? Yeah, I mean, they. I spent hours on the phone with them. Uh, so the four primary singers that were the background singers for the Partridge family were John and Tom Baylor, Ron Hicklin, and a woman named Jackie Ward. Jackie uh, Ward, yeah. Yeah. And you and see there were, all those names on the back of the uh, Ray, Ray Conniff albums. Yeah. And, and there were a few others that kind of came in and substituted here and there throughout. Yes. But they, were, they were the four core people. And um, actually, John Baylor told me the great story that's in the book about how he almost didn't do it. Um, Billy Strange uh, had called him up and wanted him for the Partridge family, um, but they weren't so sure that they wanted Ron Hicklin. Mm. And so, because Ron Hicklin was associated uh, heavily with uh, the union. And right. so there was this sort of monkeys thing, this sort of, he was sort of persona non grata with the thing with the monkeys. So, but John Baylor was very close to Ron Hicklin and said, you know, if you're going to tell me who I can have and not have, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> that I'm so not they, do said, it, yeah. they said, We're, we'll get out of your way. You know, you can have whoever you want. So of course it was Ron Hicklin and John and Tom Baylor and Jackie Ward. Um, it didn't start out though with only four singers. The Partridge Family pilot was shot with eight singers and no lead vocalist. It was going to be a harmonized kind of sound. Um, but what happened was they sold the pilot that way. If you watch the pilot, you know, David Cassidy's lip syncing and the sound of the music's very different. When they sold the pilot, uh, Wes Farrell came on as music producer and he had the vision for the sound that he wanted. He saw David Cassidy and wondered if he could sing. Meanwhile, David Cassidy was doing the same thing going, I feel kind of silly lip syncing. I wonder if they'd let me try out. So the music producer and the singer get together. Uh, and then Wes Farrell had auditions for the background vocalist, which was basically calling in the same people, but limiting it down. And so he cut it down to four people because he wanted more of a family sound, um, believable yes. against what you were watching on the television show. And uh, there you have it. I mean, that's that's how the Partridge family came to be. And, you know, David Cassidy suffered for years and years with the image. Um you know, he was a great yes. vocalist. I, I mean, the, the guy has this amazing voice. And I don't feel like he ever got credit for that voice. Um, he has a voice so distinct that you know who it is the second he starts singing. And there's no one that sounds like him. Uh, I always felt Karen Carpenter had a voice like that. There's still to this day nobody who sounds like her. Uh, and I felt like David Cassidy had a voice like that. So, um, you know, they had that magic. Then the four background singers who were, again, the top session vocalists, you put all that together, you've got great music. And it, it really, um, it was marketed as bubblegum because they had to do that, but it, it's not bubblegum music. I mean, take a listen to, I don't want to say anything bad about, but I mean, there's a lot of music that you could listen to that is bubblegum. <laughs> Yummy, 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 right? It, it's that's bubblegum, yeah, right, but right. yeah, yeah. I don't. The Partridge Family was adult contemporary. It was easy listening. It was, you know, pop. It was different. It really was, and I think that's why it lives on. I think that that there's a fan base. There's an international fan base that still is very passionate about that music. Um, and you know, David Cassidy oh, had yes. a, a long career as a as a singer. Um, doing well with his fan base all through the years. So yeah. Yeah. It was good music. Do you miss the, uh, do you miss the theme songs? You know, a lot of the shows today, there's very yeah. little, if any theme song, and there's very little of anything that you'd be humming, singing along with, or that you're even yeah. going to remember four years from now, like I you do, do with the shows the of then. So do I. Don't you? I do too. Yeah. I'm, you yeah. know, 
is it is it an era that that is so great or are we just getting old <laughs> <laughs> you know, are we our parents talking about the you know think it, it, is, is it, that what you know it was? It was it was I think it was because it was sort of not threatening, welcoming, warm, yeah. melodic, and you know, it just goes in your ears and goes to certain areas that are uh, yeah. pleasure centers in your brain that make you yeah. feel good like you can breathe you know th that's the same time period that a lot of that music was also on the radio that sound and then you had the instrumental beautiful music easy listening which was also on and you just a yeah. lot of stuff that made you feel good and now a lot of people say well where do you go to feel good of course the gym masters show is a place to come for levity and to feel good that's right but i mean everywhere else with all the stuff going on in the world, where do you go to feel good? And, you know, and, you know, it's uh, funny that you talk about um, as, as a theater guy, I, I watch those old shows and, and I appreciate things that maybe people can't quite dissect what it is they like about the old shows. And, and, but, but having worked in the theater, I can tell you things like sets. They had sets that you could see and appreciate. Now it's blurred out backgrounds and yes. shaky cameras and extreme yes. close-ups, right? Green screen. You don't, right. You don't get very to appreciate. Very raw and reality and in your face. Yep. Yeah. The studios were, you know, that, thriving. And yeah. The sets and the how they shot the color. The, the color. How about the color? You know, yeah. as, as advanced as we Film are. Film this quality. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. I just think that there's a lot about that era. I always say that my favorite era in film, I think the movies were the best in the 40s. In the 30s, they were figuring it out. In the 40s, they nailed it. With TV, I feel the same way. The 50s, the 40s, 50s, they were figuring it out. The 60s, 70s, they had it. Uh, that that, But that's just me. Oh, you know, yes. uh, that's how I feel. No, no, no. You'll laugh. We were, we just got back from a family vacation, visiting family, sister's oh. birthday, Mother's Day and everything in Florida. And, um, you know, they're all from the Northeast, but they, they have homes in Florida. And uh, we watched For Love of Ivy with Sidney Portier <laughs> and uh, Carol O'Connor from 1968, Quincy Jones's oh, wow. music. Uh, that time period of late sixties, early seventies, yeah. um, you know, the guests who's coming to dinner, the out of towners, Jack Lemon, yeah. Sandy Dennis, there's something about that period, uh, that is yeah. th those it's movies and that time it's, it's, it captures yeah. something. It does. There's, there's like a style, there's like a flair, there's make believe, uh, but yet believable, if that makes any sense. Um, but I love the escapist right. quality of it right. all, right? There's nothing escapist about the television today, I don't think. Uh, you know, I'm just, uh, I don't know. I st I'm stuck in the past. What can I say? No, no, hey, no, you, you work in the industry as do I, so you can see the subtle changes. So many of the commercials, too, you, you see the commercial come on loud and, yeah. blah, 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 and you're like, what was the product? What were they yeah. selling? <laughs> We, we, yeah, yeah. I don't feel it. I don't feel anything. I don't. Where is Madge with Paul Malov and and uh, you know Where's the actress the... that played the uh, don't uh, fool Mother Nature, the uh, Imperial oh, yeah. Margarine. And, you know, where's Santa where, Claus? Where's Morris where's the Cat? Right the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Santa on the Norelco on the uh, shick, the Shick Razor, the Norelco. Yeah. Yes, right? right. Where's Tony the Tiger? Oh, where's the Green yeah. Giant? What happened? Smokey the bear. <laughs> Smokey the bear. Yes. And where is Gilligan? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. There he is. You know, I can't believe you have you know, that. I have, to, the, I have to tell you this story. You know who I gave it to me? Mention. Who did? Dream of Denver, Bob Denver's wife, was a guest on our show three times. She's a big fan of the show. And uh, she saw that we have the I Dream of Jeannie bottle and other things here, TV related. And she said, Jim, you have to have a Gilligan. So it says, Aloha, Jim, Dream of Denver. 
of course, Bob well, played Gilligan, uh, and she sent it along with love from Dreama. I have to tell you this because I, there's there's no coincidence. Bob says hi. Here. <laughs> I I did this convention about a year ago and met Dreama Denver, and um, she did a children's book that I really like, and um, I, and of all things, I was going to do this same convention, which is this weekend. And I couldn't do it because of other commitments. And I spoke with Dreama Denver today. Isn't that just the crazy? And and I I haven't spoken to her since the day now, I met her. When now and now and now, if you had said I'm going on the Jim Master show, oh my God! Tell her after that you were on it, and uh, because she's well, she's, I've she's never become a I dear friend. The, but I spoke with her the day I met her, amazing. and then it was kind of a fluke that I got to talk to her today. It was. Uh, had to do with another friend and something I was working on, but, but it's kind of fluky, isn't it? That you just held up that Bob Denver thing that, that that's just so wild. Anything you I have to love... say about I dream of Jeannie? Oh, <laughs> I love that one too. Oh my God. You've got the bottle. I love it. Yeah. We got the bottle. <laughs> all right. And of course, remember this was patterned after the Jim Beam liquor bottle, right? That's how they got yes. the uh, design for the original bottle for the series on NBC. So does she come out when you Jimmy rub Jimmy? it? I mean, does she pop? Does she pop out the top? I mean, yes, she's taking a nap right now. It's been a very long day. She's, she <laughs> oh, okay. is in there. Do you see her in there? Do you see the you see the couch with the beads and all? <laughs> I love it. She she sends her love. She sends her oh, love. <laughs> you've got connections, guy. <laughs> got a few things that here that uh, tickle our fancy. Yeah, some really good things. I love it. Well, look who el look who else we have here. George Burns is in the house. Uh, <laughs> you need to be on that collector's call show. Have you seen that? I was. Oh yes. Well, my right? aunt collected dolls. A serious collector in West Hartford, Connecticut, and she had a room designated in her house to every kind of doll, not just these kinds of dolls, but every kind of doll. And uh, she had the George Burns and it got passed down to me through my cousin. She said, do you want the George Burns doll? I said, absolutely. So it's a real collector's doll. It's supposed to be, you know, wrapped in plastic and put away, not really handled, but he's there with the cigar and the hanky and yeah, George Burns in the house. He always pops up on our show. So he's become a regular. I did a nostalgic show once and everybody fell in love with him. Now they look for George Burns. So oh, I said, you know, maybe one of these days when I am away on vacation, George can do the show for me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But but George is in the house. Isn't that cool, huh? That is the key so is it puts cool. smiles on people's faces, and so that's what have, it's all you know, about making people now smile. You need, like, like now you need a, like the Partridge family well, on stage singing or something. You know, you need some kind of like real life Partridge. Uh, the family. lunchbox. Remember the, the lunchbox? Lunch <laughs> I love it. That's right. <laughs> um, Don Full of Love, who played Goldie Wilson, Mayor Goldie Wilson in uh, the Back to the Future movies, he saw the genie bottle. He saw the Gilligan. He saw the George Burns. And he said, I'm not going to be him when he was a guest on the show. He said, I'm not going to be left out, Jim. You got to have a Goldie Wilson. You've got to have a Don Full of Love. And here he is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that's crazy. I love it. Mayor. Oh, that's great. That's Isn't that great. something? Yeah. So he shipped yeah. this from his home in California and he's a part of the set as well. It's cool. You know, we like, we like to have fun here. And um, that is great. So the reaction to the book, you know, you're, you're really, these shows, like you say, people are very protective of them. People are connected. Their lives are connected to these shows. Some were children, some were teens, some discovered these shows later on, you know, during uh, the creation of these nostalgic networks, things of that nature. So, um, you know, it's sort of protected territory. And you were probably very aware of that when you were writing the book, right? I imagine the feedback has been terrific people probably opening up to you about how much that time period those songs that cast that show yeah. means to them 
And, and it means so much to me when I hear it too. It never gets old because I understand how they feel because I feel the same way. So, you know, when they see the book uh, and the fans have the book and they, you know, respond to me or send me, you know, messages or whatever, uh, it means a lot to me because, because I know how they feel. I, I am one of them. I am a fan. That's where it all came from. And so uh, the fact that I could deliver something that I wanted, therefore knew they wanted, it, it's, um, you know, I, I just feel like the luckiest guy in the world. I don't know how else to put it, but I just really, uh, mm. yeah, I just feel the really Derek lucky. line, yes. It, really lucky. It just, uh, it's, it's been in such an amazing ride on that bus. I like to say it's just such an amazing ride on the bus. So yeah. And it keeps, like I said, it keeps rolling. You still, Let's keep that. You still talk with Danny and Shirley, Susan, you know, some of the, uh, the remaining. Um, yeah. Yeah. Shirley, I, I know really well. And then, you know, from time to time for, for uh, different reasons, I will um, speak with uh, some of the other ones. But uh, Shirley has been my, I mean, Shirley has been the light that has just been the headlights to the bus. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, she's really welcomed me yeah, and yeah. supported me. And uh, when I went out to promote the book, uh, she got behind it. And that was just amazing. I mean, unbelievable. Like you know, Shirley Jones, Shirley Jones, my TV mom, she's behind this. She's behind me. It's mm -hmm. unbelievable. How do you come up with words yes. for that? I, I yeah. just don't know how to describe it. And like you say, the Cassidy family as well. Uh, Ryan Cassidy, I know, of course, you've worked with him and uh, yeah. have done some wonderful things with him as well, which is fantastic, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we'll talk about that another time, right. Without giving it away, but, uh, yeah, right. you know, Ryan, Ryan and I, uh, worked a project together and, and so that's been amazing. And, uh, and I got some more surprises coming down the road too, but, uh, you know, how about and, Sean Cassidy? I know a lot of people always ask about Sean as well. I don't know Sean at all. You know, Sean's out touring again. Sean is uh, doing concerts. Yes. Um, in fact, he's coming uh, nearby my area, Pittsburgh. Actually, Shirley's from Pittsburgh. Uh, her hometown is a little town called Smithton. And um, she had come back and done a convention down in Pittsburgh uh, real early on that, um, again, she welcomed me to come along. And so it's kind of cool. You know, Sean's going to be here. And uh, I think he's playing in Pittsburgh somewhere. In Kent State, he's doing a concert this summer sometime. But I don't know him. No, I, I know Ryan. Yeah, a lot of the uh, folks probably had those posters on their walls. David yeah. and Sean, you know, uh, next to the Donny Osmonds and <laughs> yeah, yeah, and all the rest, right? <laughs> oh, right on. Oh, the good old days, right? Donny Osmond always seemed like he was, you know, on David's trail there, right back in the Teen Idol days. You know, David was uh, when David went on. Puppy and, love, Donny, right? Donny Osmond was sort of the next one up, and and I think throughout their careers too, there was a lot of that. Donny Osmond had Soldier of Love, big hit in the '90s, and and right That's after right. that, David Cassidy had his big comeback. Uh, so yeah, they, they had some similar moments in life. Vegas success in Vegas, Vegas as well, exactly. You know, I'd be remiss. One of our viewers, Merlin and Ken, says that she loves the Gym Masters bobblehead. And one of our viewers, Maureen, watching in Arizona, she sent this for Christmas. They actually sent me one of me, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Lovett. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's great. <laughs> Isn't that something? I tell you, Maureen in Arizona sent this, had it custom made for Christmas, and there it is. Because, you know, joining the cast with all the rest, right? Isn't that cool or what? <laughs> I love it. Yeah, right. <laughs> this was a total surprise at Christmas. It was really, really a cool, generous gift, of course. That's, as well. man, that is. Um, yes, exactly. Oh, yeah, too. Uh, 
Mary Beth says, Mary Beth, welcome. Uh, both Donnie and David did Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream code as well. Right. That is true. Yeah. Uh, Joseph, David did it in um, 1983 and it was very successful for him. It was sort of his kind of first uh, real successful venture onto Broadway. He had done a Broadway show when he was like 19 that, you know, open and closed in three days. Then uh, he went on to TV, yes. the Partridge family, uh, crazy fame. And then by 1983, he was back in the theater. He had done Little Johnny Jones. And then um, shortly after that, Joseph, which, which was a big hit for him. And then, of course, in the 90s, Blood Brothers, which was the greatest of all of his Broadway shows. Mm. Yet, matter of fact, uh, Joseph watching in Connecticut says, I had the privilege of seeing David and Sean on Broadway in, in the 90s in the play Blood Brothers. They were excellent. And Petula Clark played their mom. He typed that just as you were saying it. Talk about some of this intuition that's uh, happening here tonight with the Gilligan Dream of Denver. Oh, You're yeah. saying that. And our viewer, Joseph Rowan Jr. in Connecticut, types that. As you're saying those words. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Blood Brothers. Of course, he, was um, very, he was great. They were both yeah. great. Sean and David and Blood Brothers. They were excellent. And then, of course, with the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, I believe Andy Gibb did it for a little bit, too. But, you know, it didn't last too long for him, unfortunately. But uh, Actually, I think David he took replaced. a stab at that as well. Yeah, I think David was That's the replacement right. for Andy Gibb. Yeah. yeah. David was yeah. the replacement for Andy Gibb, right? Andy was going through his uh, struggles at the time, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I uh, what, what are some of the things that you're working on as well? In addition to, you know, writing and being a, an author, tell us about some of the other things that you have happening at the same time. Uh, <laughs> that's enough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I still, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have my, I've got about three other projects work that I'm writing at the same time um, uh, that I can't really talk about yet because they're not far enough along. I got a long ways to go on them, but um, I, I'm, I'm definitely booked with plenty of work uh, as a writer going forward here for the next several years, which is fantastic. Um, but a lot of time is going to go into them and research and all of that. So, yeah, we'll talk about those down the road, hopefully. Uh, one of them That's is- That's what we the, call a teaser in the industry, folks. It's a stay <laughs> tuned, you know, right. uh, it's a film at 11, bulletins at once. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> that is yeah. cool. That is great. So are you still- um, are you still performing yourself as well? Not, no, not lately. No. It's been a while since I've done that. I just don't have time for any of that right now, but I no, miss yeah. it. I really miss that. I miss the theater uh, a lot and I would love to get back into that at some point, but, but, you know, it's just uh, right now, you know, this is, I'm kind of where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, I'll just keep riding that train and uh, following kind of the lead of life and see where it takes me. In writing the book, what are a few things maybe as you were gathering, you know, all the notes and doing all the research, what are a few things we don't, well, of course, want to give the book away, but are there a couple things that just you personally learned about the series, the music and everything that uh, surprised even you along the way? Oh, lot a lot of things. You know, I thought I really, and all of us who were diehard fans of the Partridge family, I think always felt that, you know, we kind of knew uh, most of the stories, but no, man, there was, there were endless things that I discovered along the way. Um, well, one of them was what I told you about the background vocalists and, you know, how there were eight of them in the beginning and then there became four and, you know, that was news to me. Uh, the lady who um, who designed all of the album covers, 
she actually had a story behind every single album cover. And, and I thought that was amazing that the, the album covers were not thrown together. They were very, very meticulously thought out. And the woman who designed them was very proud of what she had done. And those, those stories blew me away. The bus, the things I found out about the bus. Oh man, it had been misdocumented for 40 years. Uh, what the make and model of that bus was. It in in terms of what's been put out there, it's been wrong all through the years, and so I was able to unearth um, basically the um, oh uh, what am I looking for here? That it's the design from Chevrolet. I I have the design, so I know what the make and model is. I have copies of them. I should say that, uh, but the the research that went into the bus and uncovering the story behind the bus, the coolest thing about the bus is first of all not only do we not know what happened to it i know that we know the path up to about 1976 which is something that i discovered that was new to me in the book um but the make and model of the bus itself is so rare that if you wanted to find the same make and model and paint your own partridge family bus it's almost as impossible as trying to find the partridge family bus that's how rare the make and model is. It was a make and model that happened in 1955 during a, a three to four month period that uh, had never been done before and was never done again. But this bus came out of that period. So the bus traveled to California, ended up in a school system. The school system was getting rid of the bus and sold it to the studio for $500. And that's how it became the Parker family bus. So uh, that's a cool story. And there, there were endless stories like that, especially behind the songs, you know, learning that some of the songs had literally been inspired by the Beatles uh, and some of these other people, the songwriters that wrote those songs were just br as brilliant as the vocalists. So, yeah, I there were endless stories that I, I was surprised to learn along the way. That is so cool. A little bit of a pregnant pause there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you clipped out we, on me. We, we wanted we wanted that bus thing to just that story just <laughs> to, to sink in because I think people resonate, are right? yeah. shocked by that <laughs> riveting information about the bus. Did you get a chance to uh, go on that iconic ranch? where all of those facade houses were for all of these epic shows, Partridge Family, Father Knows Best, I Dream of Jeannie, uh, Hazel, Gidget, I mean, all of them there. Did you get a chance to visit uh, you know, that area? Oh, you just hit on like the most painful piece of the sinking. And it's coming feeling. down, right? Are they taking oh, that whole thing my, down? taking that stuff down. Can you believe that? Should that should be preserved, right? Oh, I know. Movies were done there. and Yeah. yeah. TV bewitched. history. The, be yeah. the bewitched house across the street from the Partridge Family bus, or the Partridge Family house. Yeah, the Partridge yeah. Family house was used for other shows, too. Do you recall what other shows the facade was used? Yeah, you know, you're catching me. It's in my book, and I can't remember. It was, yeah. I'm thinking that it was, well, I know that it was used for the middle not too long ago. Was it used uh, for My Three Sons? It No, it was used for, I'm thinking it was Dennis the Menace. If I'm wrong, everything uh, yes. man in the world is going to be emailing me. Uh, but I think that's that was one of them. Um, I know it was in a Lowe's commercial at one point. They used it a yeah. lot. But uh, yeah, isn't it sad to see what's happening uh, with them tearing all that stuff down? I just can't well, believe that. When I was on a TV shoot uh, out in LA, I said there's two places that I wanted to go see. One was what was happening at the time was the um, renovation of the Brady Bunch house, the, the special they did on HGTV. Yeah. And I knew one of the producers of that series uh, who creates a lot of the shows is a friend of mine. And what they did was absolutely epic to take that house, which again, they really only used the front of it for there was exterior shots, but yeah. the inside of the Brady Bunch house was not at all like what we saw from the Paramount studios and what they did bringing in the Brady kids and property brothers and just that whole thing. 
So I wanted to see that. So I got a chance to go there and see it as they were working on that. And then I wanted to go up to Pasadena to see the house that was used for family. Oh, um, which yeah. is this, just this beautiful house right there with the tree. And it was really, really nice. And, and it turned out there was used for a lot of other things, uh, a couple of movies and things of that nature. But, you know, that's another thing, too. When they would use real houses or at least exterior shots of real houses, a lot of times you get people who want to go there and not and of course not me going up on the property knocking on doors and wanting to go in but there are people who are so enamored by wow. the house they want to go in and they want to knock on the door of people who own the house who have nothing to do with the show yeah and the inside doesn't even look like the show oh i want to come in and have a cup of coffee with seda thompson uh she's not <laughs> here right now she's at the market with <laughs> meredith baxter bernie <laughs> <laughs> It's like uh, it's oh. funny stuff. You mentioned the bus, and we dug up the a photo of the bus, huh? Oh yeah, w who wouldn't kill to ride on that bus? I'll tell you what, that I is iconic. It really is, you know. It really, really is. Do you have a favorite episode? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, you know, I kind of get I get torn between the Christmas episode is probably mm. my favorite. Um, uh, other than that one, I love this one episode that happened towards the end of the series called Keith and Lori Bell, where um, the two of them, Susan Day and David Cassidy, have to um, pretend that they're not brother and sister and and they're, they're on a date. Yes. Oh, that one cracks me up. I mean, that one just makes me laugh out loud. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one, too. Right. Exactly. Um <laughs> Cool stuff, I tell you. It really, really is uh, yeah. on so many different, so many different levels. In addition to the Partridge Family, what other shows did you also enjoy of the time? Uh, Carol Burnett show was, yeah. uh, you know, if I were to, if I were to pick my top five, I would tell you that the Carol Burnett show would be one. Um, do you remember this this show called The Night Stalker? It was only on like one season, and it started oh, daring. Yes. I loved that show. I don't. I don't know why, but I just did. Um, uh, and I would say the Bionic Woman was a big show for me. Uh, Six Million Dollar Man. They, those would probably be my top five, right around in there. Did you like the? Do you like the Twilight Zone? You know, I really the like. It. Yeah, I like it. Um, it it airs locally on this channel that I watch all the time, and I'm starting to get tired of it. It's on so much that I feel like I've seen every episode more than I've seen the Partridge Family, and that's a lot. <laughs> How many times do you think you have seen the Partridge Family? I couldn't even begin to guess. Oh man, a lot. I remember coming home from school when I was a kid, and it was on uh, three different channels. Uh, and I'd flip around the channels so I could see it three times in a night in the reruns, you know, when they would play it after school. And then they came out with VCRs. We yeah. record the episodes. And then, of course, the DVDs where you can get the clear, crisp, you know, yeah. quality versions of the series. And then, of course, you know, all the nostalgic networks. When the VCRs came out, no one was playing the Partridge Family anymore. It was like the 80s. And so here you had these VCRs, but you couldn't find the show. It wasn't, didn't kind of resurface till the 90s. I think. Yeah. It kind of, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's some shows, right? Right. Like that are out there that um, you don't see as much, like Mothers in Law with Kay Ballard and uh, yeah. Eve Harden. You don't see that rerun a lot. And a few others, sometimes where there weren't enough episodes, you know, that golden five-year mark, you hit the five years, you can go into syndication. Yep. Uh, some of them are just under like four or what have you. Uh, Merlin in Canada said she just did some research. She just looked up and she said, the bus is the final resting space. What place was Los Angeles junkyard in 1987? No, no, Maybe. no, no. So here's the thing. Yeah. Everything that you Google most Throw out. Is wrong. <laughs> and so right. let me give yeah. you, so let me give you, you have a wart on your foot. Go to the doctor. <laughs> don't go to Google. <laughs> you know, yeah. Google, Google has it all wrong. Let me give you the, your short class in the Partridge family bus. Here's the short class um 
the Partridge Family bus was next. The, the show canceled in 1974. In the fall of 74, um, you can spot the bus on a show called Apple's Way, and it's painted completely white. So anybody who ever says that they found the Partridge Family bus, because look, here's the Mondrian colors. No, it was painted completely over by the fall of 1974 and used on Apple's Way. On the CBS, next, Apple's Way. Yeah. Yeah. The next appearance it makes as is Manson's bus in the 1976 movie Helter Skelter. Oh, and it's yes. painted again. Then that's the last time that we ever see the Partridge family bus so far. Uh, you know, I it should be in know, the Smithsonian or something. Oh, uh, yeah. I would yeah. still, you know, I still hope to figure out like what happened to it. Even if it went to a junkyard, I, I'd like to know where. But um, one of the other things that happened was that there was a Bell Records promotional bus that looked exactly like the Partridge Family bus. They did it on purpose. And they were going to take it out to use it to promote the music. Well, the music took off so quickly that they barely used it. And it didn't run very well. So mm. they parked it. The Bell Records executives had it parked in their driveway for a couple of years. And it eventually makes its way to this little place called Lucy's Tacos. And that's where it sat till 1987 when... That was all demolished and not Lucy's Tacos, but the, there was a parking lot put in next to it. And the bus went away from there. We assume it went to a junkyard. We don't know for sure, but that was the duplicate bus. That wasn't the Partridge Family bus. The bus. So, right. So, you know, it's quite a story. It is just quite a story. And it's a story that isn't finished yet. You know, what happened to the duplicate bus for sure, I would like to know. And what, of course, happened to the real Partridge Family bus for sure, we would like to know still. And then there was, um, of course, just like this, the, the two different Darrens on Bewitched, there was two different uh, boys, you know, that played that younger role on the Partridge family. And some episodes you can see one, some episodes you can see the other. And yeah. that's always an interesting thing that would happen on uh i mean the soap operas have always done that you know the role of uh john q public is now played by <laughs> <laughs> like a new face but, but on those face. shows back on these shows all of a sudden it was just a different person doing it there was no announcement necessarily one of the producers of the partridge family uh, i asked him about that and he told me how he came onto the show in the second season found out they were they were replacing the original chris and was just completely like freaked out over it and worried and, you know, went to the executive producer and said, what are we going to do? We're going to get all these letters. And the executive producer was like, don't worry. It's fine. Everybody will be fine. And he said they, you know, never even got a letter. Uh, I think it was a thing that they kind of got away with at that. Not time. even from his mother. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Oh, man. But, you know, both both of them were great. You know, the, the first Chris and the second Chris, uh, you know, they were both wonderful. And, you know, I think that, that fans have an appreciation for both of them. Absolutely. And a real appreciation for, you know, everything that you do to, to preserve all of this in the many ways that you do with a real, you know, a, as an aficionado, as an expert, as somebody that works in these industries as we do, but also as a fan, uh, you know, not just somebody who says, okay, let's write something about the Partridge family and I'll do some digging and we'll put it together or, or just to try to um, dig up stuff that's salacious and all the rest, but just to really pay homage and celebrate the series, the music, all that went into it, the people involved, the cast, the producers, and just, uh, you know, celebrating the fans as well. I think it's a, it's a terrific thing that you've done with Johnny Ray. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. It, it, you know, in the whole process of doing it, one of the things that I, I really realized along the way is that I really wish that I know what kind of time it took to talk to that many people and to go through that many articles and all of that. Um, I wish that there that biographers of any subject um, spent more time on some of the biographies that come out because yes, um, I agree. It, you know, in so many different categories. I mean, not even just entertainment, but. Uh, you know, I, I just feel as though, again, take the time, just take the time 
and uh, dig up everything that you can find and um, go get your publisher later. You know, don't get underneath a, a deadline and have to deliver something when you could make it 10 times better. Uh, I, I'd like to see more of that happen in journalism. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. I, you know, spend time. That's kind of like what we do on this show. People have said, you know, bringing back that lower sort of conversation with the, the humor and interactivity, the comments coming in from all the viewers, the lovely viewers watching around the world who have been celebrating all of this as well. And we thank them. Uh, it's a, an old school way of doing it a little bit and long form a little bit as well. But I think that makes for good. I don't even call these interviews i call these conversations and there's there's a difference a conversation you feel invested and we're all learning and we're all on equal footing it's like yeah. you know my chair is not higher than yours <laughs> yeah actually yeah. in these square boxes we are equal it's right the way it, it's the way it should be you know we're all participating learning and engaging uh, as are our viewers or kind of like our studio audience and i think that's when i started this almost a thousand episodes ago three years ago um that's what i wanted i wanted it to be interactive and warm and fun and nothing scripted there's no teleprompters you had no idea what questions i would ask and it was just banter yeah. and humor and and good information and bringing people in and i think that's uh you know, not always out there. Um, yeah. And I think I'm glad that, you know, we're doing it and, and you're doing it as well. Really appreciating all of these incredible uh, iconic figures and all the music and the time period as well. And, and well, you do have that yeah, other book who we'll talk about you yeah, know, in another episode. Sure, your show, I love shows like this. And isn't it amazing that um, again, because of modern technology, we can have all this access to, uh, things like this that specialize in an era that we love, which is kind of what, you know, me being here, uh, I'm representing a television show from a particular era. Uh, the outlet that you make available is, um, it's unbelievable. It's terrific. Uh, it, it's fans really appreciate this kind of an outlet and your show. Uh, it's, it's just, these are good things that are happening. I appreciate that. And um, that sounds like a, a great slogan from back then for like the ABC network on ABC. This is the place for good things oh, to be happening. Yeah, I remember those commercials, right? The place yeah, that's to be. It. The place to be still the <laughs> one. Well, I appreciate those kind words, Johnny Ray. Uh, as my father has always said and told us when we were kids, I said it a couple of times on this series, and I've said it for years before I ever started the Gym Master Show Live. Uh, I think as early as seven, eight years of age, Dad always said and to, still utters these phrases and little nuggets of adult uh, information. And that is, he said when I was about eight, Jim, whenever anybody says something kind or nice to you, ask them to please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> <laughs> and that's great. That's great. <laughs> Whoever the management is, just put those kind words in writing and put management on an envelope and get it to them. <laughs> get it to those people up there. That's, that's, that's cool. Uh, here's cool. the website, folks. Uh, I know the technology was a little funky tonight. Maybe maybe we were doing that on purpose to give you a retro feeling like you were adjusting <laughs> your rabbit ears. Yeah, you know? right, Johnny right. Ray and I may have actually strategized that we were going to do it this way where the Wi-Fi was a little funky because that's usually not the case on the show. But, you know, who knows? Maybe a bird flew over Ohio <laughs> or here on the East Coast where we are in the New York area. Um, mm -hmm. So, well, or maybe we did it so you can pretend that you're adjusting your rabbit ears. <laughs> we well, went I've retro. Noticed, I've noticed that, you know, when we started this, it was still light outside. And so I'm kind of hugging the screen here because it's gotten dark. It's very behind me. cool. It looks like you're doing like some sort of sci-fi show or Fright <laughs> Night on, you know, Friday All nights and you you're going to intro the uh, Frankenstein. Light, it's all gone. So I keep leaning in because I'm like, oh, I'm disappearing here. 
you you look like right there, like you're a host of, you know, Fright Night or Chiller Theater or something. And you're about to uh, write <laughs> tonight's movie is The Mummy. <laughs> the mummy. The right, mummy. right, right. Or The Blob. <laughs> or Frankenstein. The Blob, right. The Blob. <laughs> Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Kathleen Walker in New York City says, this has been a fun conversation. Your book sounds great. They're oh. a very proactive, uh, lovely audience. We have an international audience watches around the world. Want to let everybody know that uh, we're live right now with Johnny Ray Miller, but this will be archived and you can see this episode in its entirety on our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV, where we have all the episodes with all these extraordinary guests, again, from Hollywood, television, stage, music, film, food, sports, comedy, inspiration, health and wellness, everything you can think of. And if you enjoyed the episode, give it a hearty like. There is a big thumbs up there. Make sure you hit the one that's pointing up. <laughs> thumbs up and like, comment, leave a comment on the YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Jim Master TV, we would absolutely love it. That uh, Johnny Ray, this was terrific. And I'm so glad we got a chance to put this together. Or I'm so glad we had this time together. All <laughs> right. And, right. <laughs> and yeah, uh, we will definitely have you back as you and I were chatting about. We would like to put something else together to have you back soon to celebrate the next work of art that you have out there as well, which we're very excited about. But congratulations again on everything. And Thank it's you. so it's so cool to come across somebody else who has this sort of love of television, love of these time periods, all the people involved to the point where you know, we've made careers out of this, working in these industries and still love it and still celebrate it. And you wrote a book about one of the most iconic shows of all time, still beloved, The Partridge Family, when we're singing. And uh, good stuff, my friend. I hope you enjoy the time with me as much as I absolutely have with you. And oh, we'll man, keep the porch light on for you. It's, it's been cool a blast. stuff, huh? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. The pleasure is absolutely all mine. Jane watching in Sweden where it's really late. I mean, like what, 2, 3 a.m. Thank you, Johnny, for being here and telling us such interesting stories. Thanks, Jim. Jane, thank you for watching in Sweden. Thank Joseph you, Renone. Yeah, Joseph in Connecticut down towards uh, Fairfield County, Stanford. Thank you so much. I will buy the book. Enjoy all right. the weekend. Yeah, thank you, have... Joseph. Thank you. Maureen in Arizona who sent the mini me <laughs> says johnny your energy and enthusiasm made this such a fun conversation thanks for sharing oh, your stories wow, one of the most man. iconic tv shows of my youth she says oh thank you maureen that's so nice that's nice cool, to hear cool stuff from some of the uh, lovely viewers who are commenting live uh, again, there's the website one more time to get the book and everything else, learn all about everything else that uh, Johnny Ray is up to. And uh, this was really fantastic, my friend. I really enjoyed having you here, Merlin in Ontario, Canada. Thanks, Johnny, for being with us in Lovety Hall. Oh, by the way, earlier on in comments in the Lovety Hall chat room there, they already said you're a Lovety on the Gym Masters show. How cool is that? I know there's Emmys, Oscars, Peabody's, Tellys, Tonys, Grammys, everything you can think of. But when you're a lovety on the Gym Masters show, are your, most guests say their feet start tingling. Are your feet tingling? <laughs> I think I feel it. I think it's starting. <laughs> yep. Can you feel it? Um, makes me think of, uh, what's the song? Heartbeat? Heartbeat. Uh, yeah. Can you feel, feel it? it? Dun, 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 dun. With the guitar, I can hear it too. I used to love that song. I you still know, when David I Cassidy, when I hear it, I love that song. Dun, 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 dun. That's isn't that a great dun, song? Dun, 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 David dun, dun. Cassidy opened every one of his concerts with that song. With his song? whole yeah. life, I mean, he dun, always dun, dun, opened with that one. He loved it too. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's another one too. I know everybody talks about. I think I love you, which of course iconic. I'll meet you halfway. Another yeah. great one. Yeah. Yeah. Another great Ooh, one. Um, yeah. A lot of great, a lot of great music, you know, it's yeah. really extraordinary. And when you hear it, when you pull it out now of, you know, the archives, uh, some people I'm sure have still the 45s, the LPs or whatever, they hear it online. Um, sounds good, doesn't it? Makes you feel good. Yeah, it does. It really um, makes you feel good. Good old days, right? 
<laughs> That's right. Time to pop the Jiffy Pop and get out the Pop Tarts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Jiffy Pop. <laughs> the bottom would burn. Pop. Yeah. Oh, Jiffy yeah. Oh, uh, Jiffy Pop, huh? Uh, Dave Woods, welcome to the Gym Master Show Live. So great to have you here. Great show watching from Canada. Love that. Love oh, that. Great. Cool stuff. My friend, thanks for stopping by, and uh, we'll keep the porch light on for you. And truly, I hope uh, the show met whatever expectations uh, you had and you enjoyed yourself. Oh, I had a blast. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a blast. The pleasure is mine. And and spread the word about our show. If you know other folks that you think uh, would love to be here, you know, we, we there's no length to the show. We, we do 20 minutes, a half hour, hour, hour and a half. Some ask who was the the guest that was on the show the longest, and it was in the first year of the series, and the guest was Scott Schwartz, the actor, and Scott, of course, you know, in the toy with Richard Pryor and Jackie Gleason, and he was the kid in A Christmas Story that got his tongue stuck to the pole, yeah. and it was during it was the be, sort of like the beginning, the first summer of the pandemic. Uh, YouTube goes crazy if you say that too much. And so I, so I slowly whisper it. And uh, he had a lot to share and a lot to say because, you know, a lot of those comic cons and autograph signing shows, everything was stopped. Yeah. So, and he, yeah. he's very involved in all that. And a lot of the, the child actors and all the rest, they depend on that as a source of continued revenue as well when they go to all those shows yeah. and they meet the fans and everything. So he was, he was in his backyard at his house there in California. And he was, I encourage everybody to go way back when the show was in its infancy and, and see that episode. He was very open about his life growing up in New Jersey, what it was like working with Pryor and Gleason and, and what was happening in his life then. And, you know, he didn't know what was going to happen next. He was incredibly open and real. I, I guess people feel, you know, comfortable when they come on the show, which I'm honored by. I just, we just had a conversation. I knew he wanted to share and he wanted to open and not just talk about his career in Hollywood and everything, but about his life and what he loves and everything. He, he must have uh, drank 15 diet Snapples in his backyard while we were chatting and, you know, a couple of cigarettes here and there and just was really open and six hours. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's something. Wow. Five hours, maybe. I, I was like, so we started, I think we started at seven Eastern and a, yeah, about five hours, seven Eastern, maybe five and a half. Seven Eastern and it ended around midnight Eastern. Uh, that's that's the topper. That's the longest it's like episode. It's like a bin show. So I was sitting in this chair that long, and as uh -oh. you noticed, there are no breaks or commercials. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there are, I guess, when you watch it on YouTube. But as far as us chatting live here, um, so that was cool. It was really so. People will always ask, "What's the longest?" That is the that's that is long. the longest. Yeah. Wow. That's long. Yeah. Cool stuff. Eric sends his best from uh, Culver City, California. Mary Beth Hunt sends her best from Northern Iowa, USA. And Merlin from Inner Kip, Ontario. Cool stuff. Come back. Let's chat. We'll welcome you back. Spread the word about our series, my friend. It was really oh, no. cool having you here. And and Thank all your you. friends, Gilligan, all the rest, uh, they were <laughs> right, here. And the rest, yeah. And the rest. <laughs> Next time you come back, get the collection of little mini things that you have. You got ah. your Matchbox cars. <laughs> oh, I, I do. I'll bring Hot them. Wheels. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll bring them. That's it. All right. Next time we'll do it, we'll be playing Twister when we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll be, a, that'll be an interesting show. That will go viral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for stopping by, my friend. Congratulations on all, and we'll chat again real soon, okay? Thanks, Jim. Thanks for everything. Absolutely. Tomorrow, plant another tree so you'll have two on the property. <laughs> I didn't believe it. <laughs> All right. Take care, my friend. Okay. I'll see you. Nice to have right. Nice to meet you. Cheers. <laughs> we'll see you next time. This episode is far out. <laughs> <laughs> Groovy. See you again. We'll see you.
Incredible. Lots of fun. And uh, yeah, the Wi-Fi was a little funky. I, mean, I don't know why the, you know, the screen was freezing and Lua, but hey, you got the gist of it. And uh, he's going to be back. We were so honored to have him here. What a great conversation. Took you down memory lane, talked about the Partridge family, the cast, the music, some of the behind the scenes, things that you didn't know about and other shows as well, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Johnny Ray Miller is immersed in this world as a writer, but also, as I mentioned, uh, he produced and directed live theater for more than 25 years and has presented live concert performances by David Cassidy, Davy Jones, many others, his film and TV experience. Well, he's worked on Desperate Housewives, I mentioned, Rules of Engagement, King of Queens, CSI New York, ER, Cold Case, Without a Trace, The OC, and many others. And this is his first book, but there's another book out there that we're going to be talking about. We didn't want to give it all away. And uh, we do encourage you to, uh, again, get the book. You see it on the screen there. There's another closer shot when we're singing. Cool stuff, huh? This was really a fun episode right here on the Jim Masters show. And you even got some behind the scenes scoop about the bus, the iconic bus. Did you know there was two of them? There was a duplicate bus. I mean, it's very smart actually to have duplicate anything. I'm sure there was a duplicate genie bottle for I Dream of Genie. A lot of these series and shows, there were like duplicate things in case something happened, something broke, something went missing. And the series is still on. You got to have the duplicates. So, but one thing about the Jim Masters show live, it's an original, uh, often imitated, never duplicated. <laughs> Here is the website for contact and uh, the book and everything else. And uh, really cool. Taking you down memory lane here on the Jim Master Show live series. If this is your first time watching, we welcome you. Stop by again. Our shows are on um, just about every day and the guests come from a myriad of different backgrounds. Some of them are celebrity friends of mine. I've interviewed them maybe on PBS and, and other you know venues that I've worked on in, over the years on television and radio and they'll, they've been on the show. And um, we're celebrating actually our third anniversary of this series, the Gym Master Show live series. Uh, we're going to be putting together a very special show, and you're going to be hearing from some of your favorites who've stopped by the Gym Master Show uh, over the years and some most recently as well, which is very, very cool. And of course, the main thing is that you stop by. And you enjoy. If you enjoyed this episode and all the episodes you enjoy, again, give it a thumbs up like. There's a thumbs up like icon sort of on the YouTube channel next to all the episodes. Leave a comment, drop a comment, and don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. There's a button that looks like that. Click subscribe. That really helps us continue to grow and reach more people. And these episodes then are seen by even more people all around the world. We thank you very much for being with us. Let's take a look at some of the Lovity Squad. Don't forget, you can also do super chat, super emoji, super stickers in the chat. Or when the show is not live, you can do uh, super thanks, which is also right there next to all the episodes. Great show as always. Thank you, Jim. Kathleen in New York. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that. And uh, thanks for all these great comments. This is like... Uh, <laughs> This is, we appreciate all this. You guys are truly, truly the best. Our lovities watching around the world. And those of you who watch quietly, who don't necessarily comment, you know, in the comment, uh, well, in the lovity hall chat room, but feel free if you'd like to drop a comment in the comment section. We see all of them and we appreciate all of them as well. And we appreciate all of you. I want to let you know a couple of quick things here that tomorrow on the show, we've got an extraordinary guest. We've got Stephen Suskin, American theater critic, historian of musical theater and author. He's going to be with us coming on Saturday. On Monday, maybe you've seen her with Martha Stewart. Maybe you saw her on other iconic shows. Maybe you have experienced her extraordinary food. Maybe you have her cookbooks. You may remember we had a dear friend of mine on just a couple of weeks ago, Jacques Pepin, of course. You know him for all of his incredible cookbooks, but also his many years of PBS specials with Julia Child. Priscilla Martel is going to be with us, celebrated chef, food consultant, cookbook author extraordinaire. She's here on Monday. 
I know this is a foodie crowd. You guys love when we talk food. She's going to join us on Monday. Again, this shows you the variety that we have on the Gym Masters Show Live series. Then on Tuesday, we have award-winning actress, filmmaker, producer, director, Ashley Cruzado is joining us. We're very excited about that. And then on Wednesday, boy, do we have a music legend, Norman Fox, doo-wop music legend extraordinaire of Norman Fox and the Rob Roy's. He's going to be with us on Wednesday. And then another iconic guest coming on the show again. We have folks that are just starting out in all these different industries. We have legends that join us. Broadway star, actress, director, and writer, Freddie Walker Brown is going to be with us on Thursday and many others. We even have, now this is going to be real interesting. We have world-renowned mime, Greg Goldston, going to be with us. That's going to be interesting because mimes usually don't talk. <laughs> So it's going to be kind of interesting to see. Uh, he's going to be with us. I think it's on the 31st of uh, May. Uh, check that out. Uh, that's going to be an interesting show. I can't wait uh, to have him on. And again, we celebrated everything Partridge on this episode of the Gym Masters Show Live. We really just scratched the surface. You got to get the book, read the book, find out more nuggets, more cool things. And uh, Johnny Ray is going to be back. And hopefully there is this, another special guest that might be joining Johnny Ray. I cannot say who yet. We're sort of working on that. Another fantastic person uh, from, you know, the industry and uh, maybe joining us as well. But again... Hop on the bus, start singing, and enjoy life, gang. We say that all the time. Uh, this is your host, Jim Masters. Thanking you for your time this time. Till next time around here, we don't say goodbye. We say see you later. Ciao, cheers. Shalom, hasta la vista. Avida Zane, sayonara, moilu, hejja, slancha, cheerio. Take care, be well. Love one another, take care of one another, and... Uh, Enjoy life because it goes by real fast. So we like to have a good time with all of you. Thanks for being with us. We love you all. And um, this was really absolutely fantastic. A great lineup of guests with all of you right here on the Gym Master Show. Spread the word. Tell everybody you know about our show. We're here on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. And the name of the show is the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. But you don't have to say all that. You just say the Jim Masters show live and people will know what you're talking about. One more quick glance. There's the book. Congratulations. We thank Johnny Ray Miller for joining us from Ohio. You thought he was going to be joining us probably from Hollywood or somewhere around there, right? Maybe from Beverly Hills or Bel Air. Now he's back where his roots are, Ohio. And uh, this was really cool on so many different levels. Cool stuff. All right. Um, oh, I love this, Eric. Thank you very much. I love that. That's really fantastic. I love your comments too and your suggestions. Keep them coming, Eric, there in Culver City, California. We love having you with us as well. Thanks, gang. We're going to take off. Thanks for watching this episode of the Gym Masters Show Live series. We will see you on the next one. I'll be right here waiting for you as Richard Marx sang in uh, the 80s with his song. And we'll see you on the next episode uh, soon. Just looking at a few more comments here. And look for our uh, three-year anniversary. It's going to pop up. So, you know, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the notification bell so you don't miss any of our episodes because the three-year anniversary special is going to be up pop-up situation. So you don't want to miss it because we've got some cool things we're working on putting together. I just got back from seeing family in Florida. And uh, so that's why we're working on that. All right. Take care and be well. Jim Masters, thank you for your time this time. Till next time, right here on the Jim Masters Show. Be well. Cheers. Be happy. <laughs>